Hi, we're going to talk today about the basics of long-term care coverage. Now, this is a topic that as we go through, I want to share a quote with you that I have used over the years that I think it's just so right on target. How many of you remember Rosalind Carter, our first lady? You know, here's a quote from Rosalind. You know, there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. So when we start talking about long-term care, I think that just hits the nail on the head. And for those of you in my audience, if you're going to raise your hand right now or nod your head, how many of you have been caregivers? I'm in that category. How many are currently caregivers? I'm in that category. How many of those will be caregivers? Absolutely. And those who will need caregivers. So you know what? I'm hitting 100%. You may be too. Why didn't our parents talk about this more? You know, that can be an issue because this is a topic that is part of retirement planning. They're also often just looking at income planning. Nobody wants to think about, I might need long-term care or I might be disabled at some point. And usually we're already deep into some of these situations before we even start to act on them or have the conversations. And with many of them, you're looking at issues that may not occur for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They could occur suddenly. They could occur over the long term. But I do think that it's a topic that is more on the limelight now and even at the younger ages because, of course, things can happen. And when you look at the statistics on long-term care of what the odds are this will happen to you, it can be really eye-opening. That's probably a good word. Most long-term care is only talked about at the 11th hour when we have got to do something and we've got to start using the family resources to be able to do that. Now, interesting statistic that came out just a couple of years ago. Did you know that almost 50% of the population is retiring at age 62? Now, when you retire, that may be the first retirement. You may work part-time. You may not be working you know, in your original career, but that is a tremendous amount of individuals that are out of the workforce and also that changes some of your dynamics. Why are some of these people retiring early? Well, a lot of it can have to do with caregiving, either the caregiving that they need because their health is changing or because of the caregiving that they're doing for other individuals. You know, their parents are 20 or more years older than they are at their point. Maybe they married an older spouse. It could also be an adult child that has issues. So a lot of retirement, look around, that has to do with some, uh, a lot of physical issues and many mental issues that come up. Now with long-term care, you've got the option. Do you want to be proactive or do you want to be reactive? Well, the really, the choice is all yours on this one on how you're going to do that. Now, there is a chart that is going to be inserted real quick for you can look at. And as you're looking at that and we look at when we're looking to start taking benefits on Social Security, and it's a little surprising, you know, depending upon your, whether you're a male or a female, the numbers vary just a little bit. But it's certainly the trend that the bulk of the individuals are not waiting until age 70. The bulk of the individuals are pulling those benefits usually between 65 and 66. And many of you will recognize those numbers as being full retirement age where there's no reduction in benefits. And in addition to that, there's not going to be a cap on what the earnings need to be. Now, that also ties into long-term care because of life expectancy. Now, if we look at the life expectancy, that has been increasing over the years. One of the other things that has been uh, rather unique to me is if you have bought any life insurance products in the last few years, you're going to notice that many times the illustrations are going up to age 120. So with a lot of the changes in a diagnosis and treatment, and also maintenance of conditions where many things are controllable now that were not before, we have life expectancies are, are increasing. And now the actuarials, they're believing that age 120 is really not going to be that abnormal, just like age 100 isn't that abnormal anymore. It used to be very rare. Now, 
Not necessarily so. I'm aware of a couple of families where they've got more than one family member who has made it past the century mark. When we start talking about uh, long-term care issues, this ties in with a power of attorney and a medical power of attorney. Who have you named to be able to step in and talk about some of those issues? And I'm going to encourage you in all your legal documents, I want you to go three deep. Yes, three deep. And the reason I say three deep is because I want you to name the primary person. And then in the event that person cannot serve or has passed away, you know, because sometimes you do not update these documents for decades, then we have got a second person who could step in and handle your affairs. That person has deceased or you again can't do it for some reason. Who is your third person or even a fourth person? We never want to be in a position where you do not have an advocate and we don't want to have to go to court to get one either. Now, baby boomers at this point are adding to the population. And some of us really are a little younger in our last in our lifestyle than some of the previous generations would be. So we're thinking about some things and we're also seeing individuals live longer and that makes us want to take action in most cases a little bit earlier. The other thing that's been a little surprising with statistics is sources are estimating 50% of Americans will need some type of long-term care in their lifetime. Okay, look around. If there are two of you in the house, odds are one and two. Look around. If you have got a set of, you've got four parents, you're in a, a relationship where it's a long-term, you've got a partner. So we have four parents. The odds are two of them are going to need care and one of us are going to need care. So at least 60% of those of us over 65, we're going to require some type of long-term care services. And that's usually defined as being three months or longer. So for some, it's going to be a relatively short time. For others, you're talking about maybe two, three, four, five years. Many people in a long-term care setting, the life expectancy doesn't usually go beyond the five-year mark. Now, I have seen some exceptions to that because those of us that have witnessed Alzheimer's and some of those mentally degenerative issues, we may lose some things, but because our medical care is so good, we're able to extend those life expectancies beyond what they may have been a generation or a couple of generations ago. So that affects some of our planning with long-term care. Then there's an issue of, well, if I buy long-term care insurance, well, how many years should I pay for? Because of course, if you buy a policy that only has one year of benefits, it's gonna be much less expensive than a policy with two years, three years, five years, or lifetime. That's an entirely different number. So I've inserted a chart that you can use for reference here if you're looking at, well, about how long might I need long-term care? And you understand this is the average. Now, what's the average? The average is the number that just happens to be between two extremes. So if we think about long-term care, that could be the person who needs it for one day all the way, and then they pass away. That could be all the way to the person who needs it for years and years and years. And so we're coming up with the averages that are in the middle. Now, what statistics have told us is if you are able to have care in your home, and that is the preference for any person that I've ever worked with, your average length of care that is outside of a nursing home is four and a half years. Usually that is because your needs for support are not at the level of what a nursing home support may be. So you may need minor assistance but you're able to stay in the home lot. That can be your home health care. That can be assisted living. That could be adult daycare. It can come in a variety of scenarios on what might fall into long-term care or long-term assistance of some point. Now, if we start looking at the average stay in a senior living situation, I uh, found a study that was on Florida nursing homes. And at that point, it was released in 2017. I realize that's been a few years, but you know, there are some studies that have not been done. We also are gonna go back with COVID and some other things that dramatically change things. And so I think we need to wait a little longer before we're gonna have relative data again, as we have passed that point in history. 
At that point, the average stay for nursing home residents was 892 days, which came out to be about two and a half years. And again, this is the average. As a matter of fact, you know, there are 10% of individuals who go into nursing homes that end up living there for over five years years. That can be a tremendous drain on what your resources would be when we set those aside. Now, if I start thinking about some of the boots on the ground, did you know that there are over 65 million caregivers in the U.S.? That's a huge amount of our population. And those 65 million individuals are not paid necessarily they are putting tremendous sacrifices in place. They don't always have the resources that they need. So where do we fall back on? We have to have money, time, and we've got to have people. If we don't have money, then we're going to have to spend the time and the people are going to be family members and those closest to us that need to manage those type of affairs. Another fact that I found that I thought was rather interesting is 63% of caregivers are married or living with a partner. And the majority at 66%, you know what? They look a lot like me. They're women. Surprise. Now, 25% have completed some college education with an additional 43% having graduated from college. So your educational status does not prohibit or support you being a caregiver, you're still part of that 65 million people. And then we have to start talking about the costs of long-term care. Now I can look at some of the long-term care costs and I can tell you that I've seen them anywhere from a couple of thousand dollars a month, to me, a couple of thousand, three to four, that is in like a group setting because they need nominal assistance at that point. And then on top of that, you know, if they need uh, pedicures to avoid um, uh, ingrown toenails, they need manicures to keep, you know, with their hands and their nails, those type of things. Do they need physical therapy? Get, ladies, do you ever get your hair done? All those types of things are going to be in addition to that base rate that they have. There are other individuals that have the resources or because of what they're, they're needing, you know, you're looking at $10,000 a month and up. Just go up from that number. It depends on the facility, your number of people who are devoted to you, what your resources are. So it can be very different. Now, if you are looking at, and I like round numbers because they're very easy to work with. Um, if it's $5,000 a month, that's $60,000 a year. Health insurance does not pay for this. Medicare does not pay for this. You pay for this out of your resources. If it is closer to $10,000 a month, it's $120,000 a year. Let's look at those amounts if you start taking them towards five or 10 years. So if I've got $120,000 for five years, that's $600,000 or more because you know there's going to be cost raises in five years. That can wipe out savings that took decades to put up. If it's only $5,000 a month. Well, that's only 300,000 in resources that would go just towards long-term care. Now, there are long-term care costs, depending on the, the dynamics that we may be able to deduct some of those or all of those expenses off of the income tax return, but it's only nominal in the amount of tax savings compared to what your outlay is going to be at that point. I will also tell you perception is not reality. And when I say perception is not reality, according to studies, most of you believe that Medicare or your health insurance is going to pay for this and it is not going to pay for it. There's another segment of you say, oh, I'll just go on Medicaid and the state I live in will pay for it. Many of you are going to be sadly disappointed when you realize that you have to spend down your assets to a point that there are no assets before you may even qualify for these programs. And then we can have an issue with availability. Where are the beds available for these public programs? You know, you may live in one part of the state 
And in order to get mom into care, and we've spent everything to do this, she's going to be three or four hours a day uh, away. This is not going to be a daily visit. This is going to be difficult to do because if we've got to spend six to eight hours just in the travel to and from the facility, realistically, how are you going to fit that into your life and what kind of care is mom going to have? And she's going to be alienated, even if that was never your intention, because of the availability of a facility in those situations, you may have little or no choice at that point. Now, I want you to understand a misconception about long-term care does not equal nursing home. Long-term care is often handled within the home, within families, or by changing residences, or you may see they call it the mother-in-law's apartment or something like that. It is usually only after the resources are exhausted that can manage the level of care that an individual needs before we are going into the nursing home level of care. Now, if we go into that type of a, a scenario, there's only about 21% of individuals that truly need the nursing home care. For many, for a period of years, they can stay in their own home and that is the plan. Now, in dealing with the reality of insurance and Medicare does not pay for long-term care, you do. This is where we have got to make some plans put in place for exactly what we want to happen when the long-term care needs come into play. Now, it also depends on what level of care an individual may need. Do they need a CNA? Do they need an RNA? Can they be taken care of by a facility? Can we have someone who is a young adult who's going to college who can handle a few affairs? Anyone that we have to pay or to bring in the house, depending upon their credentials and what the level of care is that they need, that's going to make a huge difference on what some of our uh, costs are going to be that we're going to bear going for in the future. Now, you also need to understand on long-term care policy, what are you buying? Now, if you are buying a benefit of $100 a day, that is a reimbursement program, what that means is somebody is going to become the full-time bookkeeper. They're going to have to keep track of how much you have spent at the facility and it needs to be paid so the claims can be turned in so you can be reimbursed. Hypothetically, if I had $100 a day benefit, that's $3,000 a month. If on day one, my costs were $75, then I am going to receive a $75 reimbursement for that day. If on day two, my costs were $150, I'm only going to be reimbursed $100 because my policy said a maximum of a $100 a day benefit or a maximum of 30 days per month. So any month that you had 31 days, you're not gonna get it for that 31st day. So it's very important that we understand what the dynamics are of our long-term care policies when they are a reimbursement plan. 